Well, good morning, Phil. Here we are again, Lytham Hall. What a fabulous day, fabulous setting, and so good to see so many people coming into Lytham Hall. Wonder Hall, Lytham Hall. I hope you're all getting ready for the concert at the end of August. But today, really, we're talking not so much about the hall, the grade one listed, fabulous, beautiful Georgian hall, Let's just think a little bit about the parkland. It's not just woodlands, it is Grade 2 listed. Listed in 1986, uh, historic England. Absolutely fantastic place to be. And we're going to have a look at some of the features and at least three or four of the oldest trees we have here at Lytham Hall. And by the way, I'd just like to thank all of you that entered the Bluebell competition that we talked about in the last video. That Bluebell competition has been won, the prizes are there, and as soon as we're able to open up for the press, we will be doing a presentation. So please watch this space on the Facebook pages of both the Parkland and Lytham Hall itself. Well, Phil, here we are now looking at a different aspect. We're looking actually at the south face and we're standing on the south prospect of the, of the Georgian Hall. And of course, the beauty of this now is the development of the parterre. Parterre systems came in in the 15th century, developed in the 16th and 17th. And of course, with garden design and with grand houses, a lot of people copied something that they had a certain, dare I say, envy for. And fashion was born. And of course, Fashion in gardening is quite interesting because you'll see some things that you think are very much older and they're actually a copy. Or if you like, people are saying, in the style of. So here we have the parterre at Lytham Hall. We've had everything here from a rose garden, a parterre, the geometric shape, strictly speaking, it just means on the ground. And of course, where would you see this pattern at its best? Well, you'd see it from above. Now, without any drones being about, of course, it was always planned that you saw it from the first floor of the house. And you've probably seen some photographs of this parterre as well. You'll see we're developing it, we're planting yew, we've got some superb topiary gone in recently. And I'm sure you've heard Peter, the general manager, talk about that. But the beauty of it is, it takes the grade, the quality, the actual style of this garden up a notch. And you've probably all noticed, we are slowly but surely developing a better and better experience for our visitors. But that also reflects the wonders of a grade one listed building and a grade two listed parkland. Right, we talked before about the styles of gardens and we talked particularly about the Victorians and their keenness on going all around the world collecting all sorts of natural history specimens whether it be animals, plants and of course we had the great plant hunters one of whom of course Charles Marys was involved very heavily with Lytham Hall itself. Now when I look at a tree like this which is the Wellingtonia or Sequoia giganteum, which gives you a clue. When I look at this, it reminds me of my time back at Myersco, when in 1969 I started the first survey and we actually planned and planted Myersco College up. And the beauty of it was, after the catastrophe of Dutch elm disease, you had plant a tree in 73 and we planted all sorts, including in the Pinetum, some Wellingtonias. Well, of course, here at Lytham Hall, there were Wellingtonias arriving in the country in the 1850s, probably planted 20 years later, perhaps, from Veatches. But they came here. And so what are we doing? We're trying to follow that with some authentic planting. And here we are with one that we planted four years ago as a half a metre high specimen. We have three of them. We've also planted the coastal redwood, the sequoia sempervirens, 
And of course, in those days, you would also have the monkey puzzles. The Victorians were very, very keen on monkey puzzles. And when I came here in 2011, we had six. Sadly, we have some replacement to do and we're down to three and we will be planting again. Similarly, we lost one of the most beautiful cedars, the cedar of Lebanon that was blown down in 1933. And again, eight years ago, we replaced that and it's in the far background behind me, nearer the hall, planted in exactly the place that it was. So, Sequoia dendron giganteum, growing well. This is going to be a star of the future, but it belongs here because we had them here before. Right, well here we are next to the cedar of Lebanon. Not, not the original one that was planted at Lytham Hall. That one blew down in 1933. And when it laid on the ground, it was this diameter, a huge tree. And we've replaced that in exactly the same spot. We surveyed and triangulated the spot. We've replaced it with another cedar of Lebanon to take its place. So there's a historic link, but it's also an absolutely beautiful tree. Cedar of Lebanon, you'll also see the Atlas cedar and the Deodar cedar as well. But this one's managed to get its feet in. It's got the roots in, it's starting to grow and they do take a while. People often ask me, how on earth do you have the patience to wait for something so small to grow? Well, actually, when we planted it, it was this high. And I think in terms of tree years, so I think, should we say, lifespans of 300 years, roughly. Some grow for thousands. But nevertheless, if we think like that, then we will tree plant. We will think of the future. We won't have things purely for ourselves and our own self-gratification. And the beauty of replanting this is this isn't for me, it isn't for you, even for your children. It's for our grandchildren and forever. The historic listing is there for a reason. And let's hope the custodians, after all that's all we are for a very short time, the custodians of such places as this will have the responsibility to treat it with respect and make the world a better place. Tree planting does that for you. We will be having a look very shortly at another tree just behind me that I've mentioned before, which is the most wonderful tree, in my opinion, on the whole site. It's a horse chestnut, but it's not any old horse chestnut. This tree is so rare that there are probably less of those in this country than there are John Carr grade one listed buildings. It is that rare. I found one in Holland. I found one possibility, one other, in the UK so far, and I'm still working on that. Because it's a tortuosa or a contorted one, we feel that it grew rather more slowly. And it could be one of the few trees that were planted when this wonderful hall, the Georgian Hall, was built. After all, if you had the money to build that, wouldn't you have a good garden? Right, well, we're going to do a bit of a feature in the near future on my top 10 trees. But I thought today we'll just have a very quick look at the top four. This one has to be number one for the reasons I mentioned earlier about its rarity, about its character. And by the way, you see the character of this today, just wait until you see it without the leaves on. And remember, it's basically a horse chestnut, but it's an extremely rare occurring variety of it called Tortuosa. So the Latin name, Aesculus hippocastanum, Tortuosa, very, very rare and absolutely splendid. What sort of myths and wonders are attached to a tree like this? And the beauty of it is, if you think of the Georgian Hall being finished in 1764, thereabouts, somebody was thinking, and I'd obviously thought before, about a garden. And we think that this one was probably planted either with or shortly after the hall itself. 
wouldn't you just want something if you were making a statement in bricks and mortar? Wouldn't you want something to make a statement about your parkland, your garden, and when you bring your guests round, they're going to see this and remember, they're going to be told what it's going to be. We're the people that can see what it is today. What a vision. And as I always used to say to students, remember, vision, passion, and the resources follow. And here we are using these wonderful resources. Fabulous tree. We've just been looking at a tree that we believe to be 270, 260 years old. This hornbeam is much nearer to 300 years old. What we're basically saying there is this. This little tree, way back then, was there before the Georgian Hall was here. And this is what makes the parkland at Lytham Hall so special. It's why it's been listed, because of the style, the quality, the rarity, the uniqueness of this beautiful parkland. And the thing about hornbeams is they're very, very hardy in the north of England, more so than beech. And of course, we're losing our beech. Global warming, terrible, terrible floods in February and the winter, followed by undeniably droughts in April and it's going to get a lot worse. We're going to lose our 200 year old beech trees, we are doing in fact, mainly because under stress they get attacked by diseases. Now this chap has done really well and there's seedlings all over the place of Hornbeam and are we planting beech? Not anymore really but we are planting Hornbeams because they're tougher, they can stand this peculiarity of drought and flood and also cold and who knows whether it might get a little bit colder still we just don't. 300 years old probably it's got to be a favourite look at the character it's just a beautiful beautiful tree another of my favourites. Right so here we are with the sweet chestnut sometimes called Spanish chestnut. This is the one we eat. If you have chestnuts at Christmas time, it's from this tree. Nothing to do with the horse chestnut, that's an Aeschylus. Let's just have a closer look at the leaf on this so that from an identification point of view, how would we be sure that it isn't a horse chestnut? Well, it's very simple because the leaves are single. And look at that beautiful saw-toothed edge. Glossy, very vigorous, ribbed on the back. We'll compare that with the horse chestnut on another day when you've got what's called a palmate, like the hand, where there are leaflets, not proper leaves, parts of a leaf that's been divided into mini sections. So the sweet chestnut, we have quite a lot at Lytham Hall, but this one's fascinating, a for its age, but also because it has survived a lightning strike and you can see the damage it's done and I'll explain why some trees do get struck by lightning and get damaged and others strangely don't. Okay, well here we have the sweet chestnut, another of my favourites. Not remember the horse chestnut, this is a totally different species of tree. And this one, again, is in the region of 300 years old. But it's pretty obvious that during its 300 years it's had quite a bit of an unfortunate life. The beauty of it is, it's recovered and grown tremendously well. And this damage was in fact caused by a lightning strike and it's surprising that not all trees are as susceptible to lightning strikes as others. If you imagine a lightning storm when it's raining, a smooth bark tree will be wet all the way down. But with a tree that's got a very craggy and fissured bark, that bark will be half dry and half wet. 
Now the only way that that lightning charge can earth is to go inside the sap of the tree which it boils and that's why it usually does so much damage. So trees like oaks which have a craggy bark, ash the same again and sweet chestnut. But this is more than just an old tree. We've almost got a theme here of mystery, mystics and woodland folk and all sorts of stories of what goes on at night. Look at this. Just look at the character in this tree. And isn't it absolutely wonderful that here we are, 2021, think back to 1721. Now, it would have been two or three years later that somebody planted a tiny little tree called a sweet chestnut here. And when they planted that, they didn't think about us coming and looking at it in this detail. But the good news is, on the other side of the road, in Hullswood there, we've planted 15 of these sweet chestnuts, and so we're looking at the next generations. It's what we do. We really, really appreciate this idea. We are the custodians, and we hope the custodians of the future will see what we saw just as we saw 300 years ago, somebody thought of us and the future. Well, we talked about favourite trees before, and of course, how dare I have a favourite? It's like having favourite children. But when it really comes to it, the Clifton Oak behind me has to be the most magnificent tree at Lytham Hall. Again, 300 years old in that sort of region, and a beautiful tree that we've spent a lot of time and effort looking after and making sure that it's with us not just today but for another 200 years we hope at least possibly more one of the biggest problems with this tree is that if you notice the width of the branches and the spread eventually quite literally especially if it's been overgrown in the woods at one time which it was on the other side, you'll find that those tree branches get so long that they actually fracture. And four years ago, would you believe, we had a dilemma. It is getting dangerous, do we have to fence it? As the tree officer at the time said, if you fence it, it'll become a climbing frame. So we couldn't fence it. What else could we do? Well, we could take it down. But it wasn't that bad. And thank goodness we didn't have to do that. What we did do, we took seven tons of timber out of the top, the canopy, from the ends of the branches. And the beauty of it is, through using professional arboriculturists, you can hardly tell. Seven tons of keeping this beautiful giant going. And when I say beautiful giant, there is something about the presence this tree has. Now, I don't believe in the supernatural, but in a way, this is super nature. And the beauty of it is that this tree virtually talks to you. You might have seen programs on TV where you can hear the sap rising, where we know that the tree roots communicate with other tree, root, tree roots hundreds of metres away through fungal threads growing in the underground area, what we call the biosphere. Just absolutely unbelievable to think that this tree, again, was here before the hall. It is beautifully preserved. It is going to struggle at certain times with drought and possibly even with flood but we've mitigated that already. We looked earlier on at the sweet chestnut, and here of course is the horse chestnut. Most people recognise them for two reasons. The candle-like flowers, and these are the very, very last from this year. But one thing I just wanted to point out was the difference in the leaf between this and the Spanish or sweet chestnut. And if I take one off, and this is one leaf, there we are. That one leaf 
is shaped like the palm of a hand. Each of these are leaflets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven here. So seven leaflets and there's the leaf stalk and that's where it attaches to the branch. So that makes it a leaf. There are no points of attachment here that will come off in the autumn. The whole leaf and its leaflets drops as one. So that's a quick and simple difference between those two. And it's called a compound leaf because it's got lots of pieces and it's called compound palmate. There we are. Well, we've had an absolutely fabulous morning again. Is it a surprise? Of course not. We're at Lytham Hall. We've looked at the trees today and I did say I'd talk about the top 10 sometimes. But when we're talking about top 10, of course, we're thinking about music. And we've got a fabulous, fabulous setup here. What a lovely backdrop. And I don't even need to tell you about the fantastic concerts that are coming up at the end of August. In fact, look along the fence, look at what's happening and make sure you turn up because Lytham Hall has never seen anything this good and you're going to see it if you decide to come and I hope you will. Thank you very much.